and as I read the Bible, this is where I guess you can say the beginning of the end of the beginning began. Um, if that makes any sense. And hopefully by the end it makes some sense. As I started reading through the Bible, I began and I said I'm going to read this analytically. I'm going to read this as a book. I'm going to take away from it all of my preconceived notions of it because that's what a textual critic has to do. He cannot allow his, his preconceived emotions befoggle his mind into in, to, to what is real and what is not in the text. He has to read it analytically and he has to separate himself from it. So I decided I'm going to do this with the Bible. I'm going to read it as a book and see what it tells me. So I started reading the Bible and as I got through the books of the Bible and started reading the stories of, of Noah, and I read that, you know, and I knew that Noah was a prophet and all this, and I started reading in the Bible that the Bible says that Noah was a, um, a drunkard, as, as it puts it, meaning basically he was an alcoholic, and that he would, you know, pass out in these stupors of drunkenness. And this is how he's referred to on a number of occasions in the Bible. And immediately something did not sit right with me, because this was a story that you didn't hear in Sunday school. You heard that Noah built the ark, and he saved humanity, and he took two and two and all the animals and all this, but they, they didn't tell you the part about the Bible says that he was a drunkard. Or he was an alcoholic. So this caught me off guard. I, you know, I, I said, where did this come from? You know, so I started reading and I, and, I, and I said, okay, this is what the Bible says. So then I would sit back and say, okay, how does that sit with me knowing what I know about Christianity, my faith? How does this sit with me? And to be honest, it did not sit quite well because I said to myself and I had a picture in my mind of the prophets being the leaders of humanity. The prophets were the people chosen to be the leaders of humanity. Therefore, I pictured on my mind that therefore they would be the best of humanity. It just seemed to make sense with me. And then I started thinking to myself, and this was at about you know 15, and I know a little bit about the world. I, you know, I, was, I was not naive to the, to the street life. Um, I had all of my friends were in it. And I said to myself that, you know, and, and alcoholic, alcoholism is a disease. And, and most alcoholics can barely hold down a, a job at McDonald's, much less build an ark to save humanity from a flood that's never happened. I said, so something didn't fit right this with me. I said, okay, maybe it's just, you know, maybe, maybe it's just something wrong with me, so I need to keep going. So I kept going, and I got to the story of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. You hear about Sodom and Gomorrah, they teach you that, you know, in, in, in Sunday school. But then when it talks about when Lot was got his daughters got him drunk and slept with him, committed incest with him. This was not something I heard in Sunday school. And again, this did not sit right with me. Because I said, these are supposed to be the leaders of humanity. I kept going and got to the story, got to the story of David in the Bible. And you hear all about David and, and how David sl uh, uh, slayed Goliath. You know, he was a courageous young man, slayed Goliath. I'll tell you that in Sunday school. But they never told me that he slept with, that the Bible says that he, he was an adulterer. He sent a letter to his army saying that during the next battle, whenever the, 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 the battle gets heated, leave, leave uh, Uriah out there. Everybody fall back and leave Uriah out there so he will die. And so this is what happened. So that would so the Uriah died, and he married her as a wife. And he was, a, he was able to have her. So these things, one after another after another, really started, really started to play with my, my emotions. You know, I was trying to read this analytically just as a book, but I could not separate it with myself as, from what I've always learned and always been taught. So I started taking these things to the scholars at Bob Jones. You know, I, I told my friend, he said, okay, let me take you to the people who can answer them better. First, I took them to my pastor of the church, and the pastor of my church told me, he said, uh, he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, Brother Joshua, you know, don't let a little bit of knowledge wreck your faith. That's exactly what he told me. Don't let a little bit of knowledge wreck your faith. He said, because faith is what leads to salvation, not knowledge. He said, faith is what is going to take you to paradise, not knowledge. He said, we are justified by faith. And he was quoting Paul. We are justified by faith, not by works. So I, sa I said, okay. But it didn't, it, it, it was an answer that my mind understood, but my heart would not accept. So I, I went to the scholars at Bob Jones <clears throat> and started asking him about these things. And I started getting the same, it was almost like this, 
this was a recorded message from, you know, from, from some of these people because they would tell me the same thing, you know. Brother Joshua, don't let a little bit of knowledge wreck your faith. You know, the, the devil will give you 99% of the truth to get you to believe the 1% of falsehood. So I said, okay. And I went back and, and continued my research of the Bible. I said, I'm not going to let this... I'm not going to let this discourage me or ruin me. I said because, and, and then I thought to myself, you know what, we're really not even, as Christians, we're no longer followers of the Old Covenant, meaning the Old Testament. We're followers of the New Testament. So let me just make it through this and get to the New Testament, and then everything should be okay. So I got to the New Testament, <clears throat> and I started reading about Jesus. And what I read about Jesus and the things that Jesus said were basically the same things I had read throughout, all throughout the Old Testament when it comes to creed. Because in the Old Testament, it says over and over again that God is one. This is very emphatically stated over and over again in the New Testament. God is one and that God is extremely jealous. Every time the children of Israel would turn away their worship from God, He would punish them so severely he would restrict their dietary laws, their, their governing laws, their laws of being able to approach him so much. And I never understood it until later on in life that he restricted these things so much for them as to remind them every single day that they had to endure these burdens that I am your God. And I say how you live, not you. This was a stark reminder to them. Just like prisons, prisoners in prison every day are surrounded by bars, inside of bars, inside of bars, orange jumpsuits, bad food, all these things to remind them every day that you are in prison because of your actions. And this was the way God decided to, to reprimand the children of Israel. That I'm going to restrict you inside of this prison to remind you that I am God, not you. So, and this was always just because they worship something else. Always, always because they were disobedient and worship something else. So when you get to the, the New Testament, Jesus basically says the same thing. When people would come to him and say, Master, tell me how I can enter into the kingdom. He said, follow the commandments. He said, I've done that. He said, okay, then sell everything you have and follow me. This was very clear what he said. Follow the commandments. Okay, you have done that. Sell everything and follow me. Another man came to him and said, good master, tell me how I may have eternal life. He said, why thou callest me good for there's none good but one that is God. And then he made a statement. And this I will refer to a little bit later. Jesus said in, in that whosoever shall obey the smallest of the commandments and teach others to do so, he shall be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall break the least of the commandments and shall teach others to do so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus also said when the, when the, when the disciples were debating about which commandment was the greatest, they went and asked Jesus, they were debating about the Ten Commandments. They said, tell us which is the greatest commandment. He did not even quote any of the commandments. He said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then, these are the greatest commandments, and all the other ones hang on these two. These are the hooks that hang the rest on the wall. So, this fit very well with me, and my heart was feeling very good. So then I made it past the four canon gospels. And I made it into the writings of Paul. And when I made it into the writings of Paul, my heartfelt feeling was not very long lasting, uh, needless to say. Um, because when you get to the writings of Paul, the entire message changes. Jesus taught that the way to salvation was through obeying the laws of God. This was the same message that is throughout the entire Bible from beginning to end. That salvation lie, lays and lies in obeying the commands of life that God has given you. You obey God, therefore He will forgive you and admit you into paradise. This was the way the Bible taught it. Jesus taught the same thing. And then we get to Paul, and Paul writes a letter to the Galatians. 